it felt a little bit more like a round with nothing to lose where you could go out there and just free wheel it, play for position. Um, and then he came out and birdied three of the first four holes to really put himself pretty out of reach for me because um, I would have started at nine. He started at 15, I think. So then through three holes, I was 10. He was already at 18. And um, But Denny, we're walking on the 10th fairway and I'm like, maybe we'll shoot 18 under next year and win. You know, sometimes that you got fin- <laughs> to finish off that. Sometimes finishing like a top five one year, you're like, all right, the next year you go play great again and have a chance to win. He's like, we can still get to 18. And then bam, <laughs> hoop, 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 hoop. And, you know, he birdied eight of the last nine, which was amazing. Like just incredible golf, probably one of the best nines I've ever seen, if not the best nine I've ever seen played. So. Uh, what's going on, everyone? This is episode 11 of the Dog Lake Show. We had uh, three-time PGA Tour winner Brendan Todd on uh, talk about how his experience was here at Georgia and uh, the pro life out on tour. And uh, hope you guys enjoy. All right, we've got a very special guest this week. Our first. PJ Tour guest, a three-time winner on tour, currently 61 ranked player in the world, and uh, played on the team here from 04 to 07, he's a four-time All-American, 05 national champion, Brendan Todd, welcome. Thanks for yeah. having me. Absolutely, oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, so I guess the first question that we would have, um, and a lot of people don't hear stories like this from you guys, but what was college recruitment like for you and was, your favorite school always Georgia or did you have, you know, were you looking at a ton of different places? So, um, I mean, I was playing pretty national schedule in junior golf from about age 14 on. So, you know, every year we'd see coaches out there. Um, we just played the tournament in Tampa at Innsbruck and I remember being on the 16th tee there, that par four over the water, dog leg, right. Playing the AJGA Rolex tournament champions there in 2001. And I had Bruce Sepler from Tech and Mike Holder from Oklahoma State standing on the tee, and the tee is about as big as this area where the couches are. And Holder always had his sunglasses on, mm. these big Oakleys, and he always had his hat pulled down low, and had his arms folded, and it was like, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hit it bad in front of this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy looks like he would chew a hole right through you if you played for him. So he was probably the most intimidating uh, college coach to play in front of. But, um, you know, I remember playing in 2000, <clears throat> I played against Christo Grayling at the U.S. Junior Amateur at Pumpkin Ridge, and we were playing our first or second round match, and he thought me pretty good. He was like first or second in this country at the time, and Hacker was out there watching us, and um, from that moment forward, Hacker and Doug recruited me pretty hard here, and they were really the first school to kind of show some interest, first big school, and so they kind of always had that top spot for me in the recruiting process. Um, I was growing up in Cary, North Carolina, so I was right down the road from Duke, NC State, North Carolina, Wake Forest, and they were always in the mix. Uh, I practiced at the same club as NC State with uh, Coach Sykes and all those guys, but I never really wanted to stay in Raleigh. Uh, My older brother was at North Carolina, so I knew that'd be a fun school to go to. I knew I'd I'd know a lot of people, but in a way, I felt like it was too close to home. And um, when it came down to it, Georgia just kind of kept looking like the, the best spot for me from the standpoint of coming to a big school uh, with awesome academics, a fun school with the football program being so big, and then you know playing a top tier national schedule um, with great guys on the team. So Kevin Kids and Richard Scott were a year above me. And the uh, kids was a guy that I played a bunch of junior golf with, so I was excited to come play with him. I knew Chris Doe pretty well. He was already here, and then Chris Kirk committed before me, so it was kind of came down between me and Luke List, who was going to take the last spot here, and um, I jumped on it and never looked back. And best decision I ever made. Yeah, absolutely. So where where um did you, you didn't grow up a Georgia fan? What was your not really? Um, my parents both went to Ohio State, and I lived my first eleven years in Pittsburgh. So I actually cheered for Ohio State as a kid. Ooh. And then my brother went to North Carolina when I was a freshman in, in high school. So then I kind of became a Tar Heel fan. I did have an uncle and a cousin that came here, maybe two cousins. So I had a little bit of an in, a little bit of Bulldog spirit in me, but um, I was definitely a Gator hater from uh, an early (laughs) age. So I was never going to Florida. That was never an option. Um, But, 
yeah, Georgia for me was kind of a surprise. How long was your first phone call with Jim Douglas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was easily an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely pretty, set the over under an a hour. Pretty, yeah, that's <laughs> a pretty popular answer, I think, for yeah. everybody. So another, just from your time here, what was, do you have like a favorite memory from that 05 National Championship that week? If you could pick one, putting you on the spot. You know, I think winning the national championship was, uh, for us, it was a culmination of a group of five guys that played pretty much every tournament together all year. So we were a really close-knit group. Um, so we had a lot of fun that week, you know, because everybody kind of got off to a good start. Kisner had played pretty poorly in the spring and then shot 65 and kind of jump-started us. So that spark we had, like, we just had a really great energy that week. I felt like everybody was clicking with their games. It was like a bunch of good play all year culminating into that week. So to win it all and be with like your best friends and Hack and Doug, the coaches that yeah. you just absolutely like love playing for. Um, it was just a really cool experience. I still get chill bumps talking about it. And it was, at, you know, not an iconic golf course, but Kays Valley, if you've ever been there, is a really sweet spot. Yeah. You know, with 18, mm -hmm. that good par four with the creek kind of running by the green. I mean, it was just like a really um, – surreal place to win a national championship so it was it was a really special special week for us yeah and so, was it just stroke play back then it was yeah four rounds of stroke play and maybe the coolest part was we had some pretty tough rainy weather on the weekend and the last day we all all five of us shot even par 70 hmm. and we were playing with georgia tech and beat them by 11 for the week so it was a it was a where are they in second they finished second yeah. so you won by 11 yeah was that the week that uh that y'all wasn't that hacker stood in the trees and hid from everybody and wouldn't take off the rain suit? Is that, is that that uh, week? I don't know. Probably. I think that's where it came from. Yeah. Because I remember Doug talking about how it warmed up the last day you guys were there. It started yeah. off kind of chilly in the morning. It warmed up. And I think that's where he started wearing the black cowboy hat. Probably. Too, on the last <laughs> yeah. Probably. We, we talk a lot about how superstitious they are. Yeah. I mean, and I think we listen to uh, Led Zeppelin Cashmere every day going to the golf course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's definitely the song I remember listening much. to. Going to the golf course. If you eat something, then you eat it again. Every, uh, yeah. <laughs> Pizza or ice cream, like, of course, they're going to work in those fatty foods. Yeah. Um, but so whichever one of those is working, you know, every night. For oh, sure. my gosh. Yeah, we've won twice this spring and we've had hibachi every tournament to try to oh, reminisce yeah? the, the Puerto Rico win. Heck yeah. <laughs> the funniest story I think I've ever heard about the whole entire eating thing was Zach Healy talking about, I think they were out in California one time and they played bad the first day of this tournament. And, uh, and Hacker was like, we're taking you guys to Sizzler. <laughs> like instead of, instead of like just anywhere else, like we're going to Sizzler. And then the next day they played really good. Mm -hmm. So they had to go back to Sizzler. <laughs> <That is sick. laughs> so, so it's just, it's a, it's a never ending cycle of uh, some strange superstitions, but. Um, Doug ordered pizza almost every night. Yeah. So, I mean, like we might be somewhere with amazing restaurants we might go eat you know we might have gone to a steakhouse well and doug hates to sit down too. yeah doug would come uh, and sit his least favorite meal. <laughs> he would come and sit maybe order french fries I'm maybe not or like cornbread but then or when something. he got back always ordered the pizza yeah oh my god he just wanted to get out of dinner he just sits there miserably sometimes he'll engage and make the whole table laugh but sometimes he's yeah. just sitting there doing his own thing waiting Dang. thinking about pizza <laughs> be ripping him about he's, that. he's <laughs> very proud he'll tell you that he doesn't eat much pizza anymore really which i think is so is he on his french fry diet or the fruitopian diet it's, it's uh it's tic tac diet oh tic tac oh, strictly tic -tac. yeah so, strictly he did, tic -tacs. Have a, he did have a chicago style pizza in florida really yeah wow when i was playing a junior tournament and yeah. uh in Chicago, it was my year coming into Georgia. So it was my, the summer after my senior year of high school. Um, it was the Western Junior. And I knew Doug was coming that week. And I don't really see him around at many golf tournaments, but he always likes to go to the Western Junior. That's just like one of his spots that he likes to stop at. So we walk into this Lou Malinati's deep dish mm. pizza place that we had a couple years prior when we were in Chicago. And we were like, we have to go back because like you don't really get deep dish pizza in southeast like it just right. doesn't happen so we walk into this place and we look over in the corner and waiting on a bench like behind the front door is doug <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> clue he was there at all. like what you doing here doug i'm just getting a dozen deep dish pizza and then uh heading back to the room yeah just chilling yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. awesome awesome yeah so just kind of uh moving into your professional golf career a little bit you were you had some early success in mm -hmm. that um and in the past 
I guess it was not not recently, but you you did struggle a bit. I remember listening to a story on the Mark Immelman podcast about how what was it pizza franchises was that the yeah so um i got off to a good start of a pro career i went on the nationwide tour in 08 which is now the corn ferry tour got my pj tour card struggled a little bit lost my card had a two-year slump pretty bad wasn't playing very good and i get my card back work my way up win the byron nelson at 14 play really well in 14 15 16 lose my game again lose my card 17 is terrible 18 is terrible and i'm running out of like momentum you know like not wasn't running out of desire or like the eagerness to practice and work for it i was still playing monday qualifiers and all that stuff but um you got, there's a past champion category on the pga tour so if you win out there you kind of always have this little bit of status dangling where we call it the island tour you might go play puerto rico dominican republic the barbasol in kentucky and reno so you might get four or five starts and i'd played those for a couple of years and you know, I was just kind of getting to a point where I wasn't sure I was going to get any starts in 2019. So I was talking to my financial advisor about potentially starting some kind of business. Like, what's a business I can start after playing golf for 15 years? And he's like, "Well, I know a guy who's done a lot of franchise stuff. So let's talk to him." I'm like, "I love your pie pizza here in Athens, so maybe I can start a your pie." <laughs> so we were legit about to start conversations of starting a your pie pizza. <laughs> somewhere here in Athens and I was going to hire the people and run it. And fortunately, um, <laughs> I did have a couple events to go play. So I went to Q school there in 2018 and I, I missed by two at second stage, but I got some momentum. I went to the RSM Monday qualifier and shot 61 at Brunswick country club. And then I went to the RSM shot four rounds in the sixties, made the cut and reshuffled up my category to where I got in about 10, 10 events in 2019 and worked my way into the Corn Ferry Finals and then back on tour. So it was like the moment we had those conversations about maybe getting out of golf and starting a pizza franchise, fortunately, so my game uh, how, sparked back. How soon between the time period of talking about the pizza franchise, how soon did you win after that? Because you won like twice in three weeks, was, right? Yeah, it was one year. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it was 2000, the fall of 18 is when we were talking about doing that. So I had, I had a meeting in December of 18 is when I was going to have the meeting. And then, unfortunately, I played played well enough to be like, ah, I'm canceled that. I'm going to keep playing golf for a it's while. It's crazy just, like, how volatile. I think just professional golf is. Like, golf, you know, it, can, it comes and goes mm -hmm. without a doubt. But professional golf out there is, you know, it seems from where we sit, like, a very fleeting thing right. or we're from where i think a lot of people like we understand how difficult it is because we play every single day but i think from where a viewer sits at home it seems like a very secure job right which it can be right to the guys you see on tv every single week but at the same time it's like it can flip really yeah quickly. and i'd say when you're in that like top 50 or 70 bubble on the pga tour and all the people you're around are the best players in the world and they're always finishing there and keeping their card and having 10 and 20 year careers it, fe it can feel secure, but if you just take a look around every any week, there's a dozen guys who are either like have fallen off or are falling off. And you know it like you're just like that guy's the scores he's putting up this year are not what he's been putting up. And he's going through a struggle and most likely it's going to take him a year or two or three to work it back if he ever does. And as somebody who's played on tour now for played pro golf for 15 or 16 years, I know more people that had a two or three or four year PJ tour career than I do had a five plus year career. And that's the perspective that I have. And some of those guys in the top 50 might not have that because they didn't necessarily grow up, come up playing mini tours or the nationwide tour, corn fair tour, or they did, but then once they got on tour, they never really fell back off. But like as somebody who's fallen, gone on and off the tour a couple of times, I've just met and played with so many pros and so many guys that, maybe weren't ever top 50 caliber, but did make it at different times or were close. So I just, I have a, a unique perspective of like how difficult it is. And I feel like as I've earned my card back and played well this time, I have a much greater appreciation for the tour, for being in the top 50 or 70 on the tour and what a great job it is and how hard it is. And you know, it, it, it can be fleeting because the difference between keeping your card and not keeping your card is about 
one swing around. You know, one swing around in the water out of bounds is a double. And that's four shots over two rounds. That's the difference between being one under and making the cut and three over. You see a guy finish three over, he misses a cut by two, let's say, if it's a one over cut. And you're like, oh, he was, you know, he didn't have a very good week, but he only missed a cut by two. But it was probably just one swing. Yeah. You know? But if you make that swing, if you're making that swing every tournament or every day, you know, it kills, it's a, it's a moment, not only hurts your score by two shots, but it probably hurts it by four because you didn't keep the momentum and go make two more birdies the rest of the round. Yeah. yeah. And that's sort of what I went through when I struggled. I just had this right miss and it wasn't like I hit it all the time. You know, I'd go out there and get two under through eight or kind of settle in, cruise an even par and then bam, lose a ball, double, shoot 74, you do it twice, you miss the cut every time. Yeah. And it's just like, man, it's, and you put so much work in in between and, you know, to go out there and repeat the mistake is just like probably the most maddening thing in, uh, in when profession, you, in, right? Like in any profession. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, it's pure insanity. And once you do it enough times, then it sits in the back of your yeah. mind where you're like, you might get to that two under three, eight number. And then you're like, right. And you can't like, stop thinking about like, it. Like where you're is, forecasting like, where your is third it? hole. Yeah. Like where is it? You're thinking about it at night. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, you could call it the yips, but it's like one yip a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Golf's crazy game. It's a crazy Golf's game. Crazy game. Yeah. So pivoting to a more positive note. There you go. Mm-hmm. More positive note. Uh, T5 at the Valero last week. Yep. So That was a good week. I know why you like that golf course mm-hmm. so much, but could you tell everybody else why you like that golf course so much? Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, historically, I've played well in Texas, and I've played well on firm, warm, windy golf courses. San Antonio checks all those boxes. Um, I like that all the holes are really framed by the tree lines. And I mean, there's a very clear boundary. Like you hit it here, you're in a good spot. You hit it there, you're reteeing. And um, so at, when I'm playing well, like those are the courses I thrive on. I don't like wide open golf courses where you can just kind of hit any shot or hit it anywhere or where driving accuracy isn't rewarded. I love golf courses that reward driving accuracy. And then, um, you know, just I feel like I play the grasses really well there. You know, like it's pretty easy for me to chip out of that overseas rye around the greens, and I putt those greens really well. So, um, yeah, it's a place I now I think I have three top sixes. So, yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite courses for my game on the PJ Tour. And were the greens overseeded as well? Or they were. were they, okay, because yeah, that's another thing. I mean, you grew up in North Carolina, so right. that's like grain capital of the world yeah. almost. So, like those greens, when we played them, that was our first college event of the fall. Like those greens, obviously nothing was overseeded back in September, but super, super, super grainy. Yeah. Like, and it was like, it, they were tricky to read with all the right. grain, but. Yeah. I mean, cause they have a lot of slope in them. Yeah, they do. I would say when they're overseeded, the, there's a little bit less grain yeah, this time ex- of year. Yeah, so like totally. they put a little more true. Um, they keep them a reasonable speed because of the spring wind. So we played probably 11 or 11 and a half on the stem. So they weren't. They never really got out of hand. Yeah. One thing that is interesting about that overseeded Bermuda too, and I heard Rory talking about this in the, with Smiley when he was sitting on 16, was mm-hmm. there's still grain, especially in this place a lot when you chip, there's still grain, but it sits under that layer of overseed. And sometimes right. you can't see it. You get these really what seem like weird bounces because you can't see it. So that right. that's another tricky thing about that stuff too. Yeah. But, I mean, he, should, he should know how to play that. Yeah. <laughs> he lives in <laughs> South Florida. <laughs> um, so just, you were obviously in the final group on Sunday, mm-hmm. but you know, there was a big gap between you and Akshay. Like what's your thought process? You know, obviously if you're a shot back or shot ahead, yeah. the sleeping the night yeah. before that is, is one thing, but what's your thought process with the big gap? Yeah. I mean, there was definitely a little bit less pressure. It, it, it felt a little bit more like a round with nothing to lose where you could go out there and just freewheel it, play for position. Um, and then he came out and birdied three of the first four holes to really put himself pretty out of reach for me because um, I would have started at nine. He started at 15, I think. So then through three holes, I was 10. He was already at 18. And um, But Denny, we're walking on the 10th fairway and I'm like, maybe we'll shoot 18 under next year and win. You know, sometimes that you gotta fin- you gotta finish off that. Sometimes finishing like a top five one year, you're like, all right, the next year you go play great again, have a chance to win. He's like, we can still get to 18. And then bam, <laughs> hoop, 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 hoop. And you know, he birdied eight of the last nine, which was amazing. Like just incredible golf, probably one of the best nines I've ever seen, if not the best nine I've ever seen played. So hats off to him. It's too bad it didn't uh, 
go his way in the playoff, but you know, he's he's playing great and Akshay deserved to win that golf tournament. He played well for four days, four you know, had the lead after every round. And the way he I played with him both days on the weekend in the final group, he was calm, he was confident, he was fearless, he was aggressive. I mean he pulled driver every time he could and he hit a three hundred and twenty yard fade down a hallway. Was he hitting it down four? Or is it for what's the short par four out there? Is it four or five? Five. Five. Is, um, he would hit three off that hole. Okay, I was about just because we didn't have a win where he could get it to the green. Yeah. So it's kind of no man's land hitting it to 50 yards there. Yeah. So he was hitting yeah. three with there. But he hit driver off one. And, you know, the last wow. day it was downwind. He hit it 330 into this really skinny Tightened spot. Up. Yeah, where if he would have missed it right, he's in the jungle. Hmm. You know, just really causing himself some problems early on. He hit driver off 15 past the bunker both days. So he was taking That's some brave. chances that, as his caddy, I would not have told him to take. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think he was on a mission, and I think he was confident in what he was doing. Yeah. That's another thing, too. Like, when we played there, one thing I noticed pretty quickly, like, during the practice run, was like, you know, you have, obviously, the fairways are they're relatively tight, but that, the hitting areas look so small because, like you said, they're just framed by trees. Mm -hmm. And, like... There's a little bit of rough on some holes, but yeah. if you hit it in the trees, mm. those trees, you're not getting out of them. Not, like, not always, yeah. At and, all. There, and there's a lot of rocks. There's rocks. So, like, you can be up against a rock. You can... Kevin, uh... Yeah, well, I mean, so, <laughs> when, the, when we first went there 10 years ago, maybe, it was a very, very dense jungle off to the sides, and they've come in and thinned it out a okay. lot. The year that Kevin uh, made the 15 or whatever it was, it was, it was thicker, mm -hmm. and... There were just fewer options to get it out. Yeah. I mean, now there's a pretty good chance you hit it in there. You can pitch it out somewhere. Somewhere, yeah. Um, yeah. But there were still some numbers made by people by getting it in there and not being able to get it out for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. I just remember, I remember there was one specific hole. I think it's maybe like 11. It's kind of a dog leg, right? And I just remember the second day, if you hit the fairway, it's a wedge in your hand. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And it's pretty, it's big green mm -hmm. and sectioned off. So it's a nice green to hit a wedge into. And the second day of the golf tournament there, I think I hit it like right and that was like okay. one of the first times i noticed like i was in the rocks and i was like i'm 100 yards from the green right now and i've got no prayer oh uh, no which is just yeah. like yeah that's that's a very unique thing about that golf course because i feel like a lot of places you go if you hit it in the trees like even if it's a tight golf course if you hit it in the trees like you're punching out but you right. might have a shot at the green right. there it's not yeah, very likely. not guaranteed at all it's very interesting you know usually you're not your ball doesn't finish on a bunch of rocks. Either. Exactly. Yeah. The yeah, rocks, the rocks is another pine thing. Straw underneath your ball, but yeah. So it's pretty gnarly there. Yeah. So not <clears throat> playing in the masters this week, narrowly missed. Mm -hmm. Um, have you ever been to the masters as a spectator? I have. Yeah. In college I went uh, a couple of times, which was really fun. And I remember we were standing, we would stand between the fifth and sixth green and I was taking three putts, and my roommate was taking two putts. And we were betting a dollar per player because <laughs> the pin on five was right on top of the of the ridge on the nose there, and everybody was sitting in the ball. And then on six, it was top right. Top right. And it was just the perfect day to have the bet. And it was about 60, 40, three putts. I was winning money betting mm. on three putts. Um, and then I went one time right out of school, maybe 2009 or 10. Because my wife wanted to go and experience it, so yeah, it's it's you know unlike any other sporting event, it's such a beautiful you know pristine place. Um, the patrons are treated really well. I think the food's really good and affordable. Yeah, it's a cool it's spot. Unbelievable place to watch golf. Like, what's what's kind of the energy like? Like standing on the driving range before going off like that first day. And I know the walk from the driving range to the tee isn't exactly short, is it? Like it's, no, I'm it's pretty, pretty sure it's a golf cart ride. Yeah, a golf cart ride. So, like, what, yeah. like is that? Is yeah, that, it's, you know, it's definitely, your juices are definitely flowing there the first day almost every year before you're teeing off. Um, just, it's just one of those places that you, you've watched that tournament your whole life. And it's probably the most difficult to get into because you have to either win or be top 15 in the world. And there's really no other way in. Mm. So, it's just kind of up here on a pedestal. Um, it's everybody's favorite tournament. You get treated unbelievable. It's the most memorable golf course. And so I think that, you know, it's the one you want to play well. So you're going to internally put the most pressure on yourself at that event and in that first round. And, um, yeah, it can be really tough. Yeah. It's how, just, many, how many times have you played? I've played three Masters. Yeah. 
it's just so quiet around there too. It like is. Even with all the people walking around, it's yeah. so quiet. I don't know how, like, how would you compare that? Like, is, I mean, obviously the waste management's off the table. Mm -hmm. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> like that's completely, um, different deal, but like, like a, just a normal PJ tour event, like how would you, how would you compare like the level of noise just on a normal day? Like, is it like, well, I'd say that, you know, the first couple of days at the masters have more fans than most PJ tour events, except for a few. I mean, the players waste management, like you said, um, and maybe a handful, a couple others get a pretty good turnout. And then obviously the rest of the majors, but the thing about the masters, everybody's so well behaved, you know, there's rules on, if you have a badge, you know, if you give it to somebody to, and they act poorly, they get thrown out and you get your badge revoked. So people are on their best behavior there. So people don't say nearly the stuff that they say <laughs> at other events, fortunately. And I feel like the fans, they do a pretty good job of keeping the fans like to the side. So you feel like you have pretty wide corridors um, at the Masters on most holes, especially like the first hole. So you kind of feel like you're out there pretty far away from everybody unless you hit it over in the patrons. So I feel like it's just like this really cool walk. It's pretty quiet, but there's a ton of people being respectful. And when you hit a good shot, it's applauded. And, um, you know, it's just that it's exactly what you see on TV from a noise standpoint, right? Yeah. It's like pretty quiet, pretty peaceful. And then there's like these big roars and, you, and you're just like, this is so and get, It can so get cool. loud with the pine trees. It echoing, yeah. echoing off all those. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. But what would you say, what would you say the main difference um, between just watching it on television as a viewer, what would you say the main difference is playing the golf course like that you what you don't see on television yeah i mean so the first thing you see in person that you don't see on tv is the elevation change everybody says it but it's a hike from the fifth well the 16th green up to the 18th green like that's a pretty significant hill and so by the time you get to 18 green you're pretty tired um and then the slopes on the greens are are big you know, like we're talking about like that, that ridge up on six with that pin yeah. sets is really high. And if you're short of the green, you're chipping pretty far uphill. If you're on the left side of the green, it's a really long, slow putt. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing you, you notice is just you don't have a lot of flat lies. You know, so like every fairway after number one really has some sort of pitch to it where like you're standing with the ball above your feet or below your feet. And, that just makes hitting the ball into those difficult greens that much harder. Yeah, that's one thing when we played a couple months ago, we talked a lot about the green complexes and how much different those are. Like what, a 14? Like you don't understand right. why people don't just go from television where mm -hmm. they have the camera set up. You don't see the big slope in the front of the green. Mm -hmm. Same with five really. Right. But you know, you don't really see the big slope in the front of the green on 14. You wonder like all day, why are people not just going at every single pin on the screen? Cause it looks completely flat. Right. And when you're out there playing or even watching, you see it from the side, it's like, well, you know, back left. If you miss it, like anywhere to the left, it's just. Actually... Yeah. 14 has a, a lot of tilt from left to right. Yeah. And then if you're the, when the pins on the right, if you miss it, right, it kind of goes down this hill. It's not that bad. You're chipping back up the hill. Yeah. But it's definitely one of those greens you don't want to get, you know, to the left of mm. the left pins. Yeah. And you don't really want to get right of the right pins because it kicks away from the green. So it's a really, uh, it's an unbelievable design, a really tough shot. Yeah. But it's also really cool because there are certain pins where you can kind of feed the ball mm. in if you hit a, hit a great shot. For but. sure. For sure. So what, um, obviously everybody sees tour players on television, but there's not much insight into like what a week off you've played mm -hmm. what for the last five. Is that what it was? I've played five of the last six. Five of the last six. Yeah. So you've been playing a lot of golf. I have. What does a week off for for you look like? Mm -hmm. Like just just in, yeah. After so playing first that day, much I golf. usually take the full day off. Um, you know, I'm driving my kids to and from school, having lunch with my wife. Probably maybe there's a sporting event at night, and then the second day I'm probably working out, maybe practicing, maybe not. Depends on what I have the rest of the week. And then by Wednesday, Thursday, I'm kind of getting back into golf mode, getting a good practice session in, maybe setting up a game to play on Thursday or Friday, which this week's gone exactly like that. I did a little putting yesterday. Today I had a good full session with my short game coach, hit some balls, and I'll probably play golf on Friday. And I'll get two or three workouts in. And then on the weekend, I'll probably put the clubs away again and just hang with the kids. 
Uh, my son has travel baseball this weekend, so we'll be in Atlanta grinding away some some nine year old travel <laughs> baseball, which will go. be fun, but uh, sometimes feels a little pointless at the same time. <laughs> the kids are the kids are young, and people take it too seriously. Um, yeah. But you know, for me, it's all about just getting back in the routine of being at home with the family, making sure I'm spending you know quality time with everybody and enjoying the stuff I don't get to do when I'm on the road. Um, you know, which is watch my kids play sports, engage with them, maybe seeing a couple friends and um, getting some practice in. And then if I'm out here and see you guys working on your game, it's always good to you know talk to you guys about it. Yeah, without a doubt. Do your family or kids ever come on the road with you? Or yeah, no? they come to about eight or eight to 10 events a year. Okay, nice. So they've already come to Maui and the Sony Open. They came to the Players, Bay Hill, and they came to San Antonio. So, you know, my kids are five, seven, and nine. So they're young enough. Uh, the five and seven year old don't really have to go to school's not as important. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if we're going to take them out, these are the ages to do it. Yeah. This is the way yeah, they feel exactly. about it. And then when summer rolls around, you know, we're excited to uh, travel together a little bit. So and a few. your oldest is a pretty avid golfer or no? He is. Yeah. 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 yeah my nine year old's pretty good. Yeah. Um, he's played, you know, 10 to 20 U.S. kids, mm -hmm. nine hole events in Atlanta. Um, last year before the British Open, he skipped baseball camp and practiced golf with me every day for four days, <laughs> which was pretty cool. Yeah. And so we were working on our short game out here at the UGA facility, which was great. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, he gets it around pretty well. Yeah. And then my, my seven-year-old daughter is not bad as well. She, she likes it. She can hit it pretty far. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I love that, that they're into golf. Yeah, just kind of let it come to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. for me, I want them to play whatever sports they're yeah. interested in. Um, I don't care if they're if they get get a pickleball, you know, yeah. or badminton. But yeah. I just want them to be passionate, yeah. and active. Yeah, that's good. No doubt. You guys had a little video go viral a few months ago with him holding the wet shot, right? We did. Yeah. So I have a a pretty cool backyard uh, chipping green, and I've got a couple of tee boxes set up with turf. He made this shot probably two and a half years ago, and. He had made it a couple of times. It's about a 40 yard shot with a little backstop. And I just have to be, I think he'd either already made it that day or come pretty close. So I just started videoing a few of them and he made it. And he's, he immediately turns around, did you video? I'm like, yeah, I videoed it. And he gets all excited. <laughs> but so like, it went viral that summer, like three years ago. And then it, like once a year, somebody will like see it again and like repost it. Mm. It gets pretty popular. Yeah, I mean, I it's, I a, it's a sick shot. It. So it got resurfaced a few months back and I was like, I remember that. Yeah, it's a pretty sweet shot. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, he, like he's just, he's always been a pretty natural golfer. So I'm excited to see, you know, how passionate he gets about it and how good he can get. What would you what would you say? This is kind of the last thing for me, but what what would you say the biggest difference between college golf and professional golf is? Like, what was what was the big jump for you, or was there anything? You know, I think the good thing about playing at Georgia and a lot of these top programs <coughs> is you play a pretty difficult schedule. Like, you play PJ Tour level golf courses. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can. I remember playing the tournament at the farm up in Dalton, Georgia, had really fast screens. We always played Southern Highlands in Las Vegas, which is a good, tough golf course. Uh, regionals and nationals were always held at, at good golf courses. We played Seaside at Sea Island for SECs, which is a PJ Tour quality course. I mean, lately you guys have been going to Colonial, Calusa Pines. At you Texas. came to San Antonio yeah. for that event. So, like, you guys are playing tour level golf courses. Um, so I felt like college was an unbelievable preparation for pro golf. And I remember feeling like when I got out playing mini tour events, I played a couple of Tar Heel tour events in North Carolina and some Hooters events, feeling like the golf courses that they played were easier mm -hmm. and all the pros fired at every pin. Like you went from playing these tough golf courses in college where par mattered to all of a sudden feeling like you better go shoot 16 under mm -hmm. just to cash a check. And so that mini tour level almost felt like a step down in difficulty. And then you kind of get your up onto the Corn Ferry Nationwide Tour, which kind of started to equal out towards college golf, but probably was still a little bit easier. And then the PJ Tour plays a lot of difficult tests and you've really got to have your A game. Um, 
But from a co- competition standpoint, I just feel like pro golf is deeper at every level. I mean, mini tour, corn ferry, PGA tour, there's more guys in every field that have a lot of competitive experience, are getting a lot of competitive reps and playing at a pretty high level where, you know, you it takes a little time competing against deep field to get the confidence that you can enter a tournament and, you know, play good and contend instead of having to play like your best. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel like in college, unless you're one of the top guys, like you can play okay and like finish 15th or 20th and be like, you know, that was a good week. I played well. Maybe it wasn't my best. Um, because you're only generally playing against 75 or 100 players yeah. at a time. And <clears throat> the four and five guys often aren't getting – a lot of competition because they might not always be in the lineup. So in my opinion, like 60% of the college field is getting a lot of competitive reps, you know, and you guys are probably experiencing it here where like, if you're not playing at a high level, you're not traveling for Georgia Mm. and therefore you're not getting a lot of competitive reps. So then when you do get into competition, it's really hard because you don't have that positive experience, whether it was a, a success or a failure and you need both to play well. I mean, I need to, have weeks where I don't have my A game and be able to grind through it. And I need weeks where I, weeks where I do have my A game and either succeed or fail um, in contention in order to keep building up to what ultimately will be like, hopefully my best level of play where I win a tournament soon. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no replacement for competition and in professional golf, you can pretty much go get as much as you want. Yeah. Yeah. It's Whereas in college, stuff. you can't. I mean, in college, you're you limited by class everything. and qualifying for your team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that's something that people don't really realize is like, that's kind of why I, I'm a big proponent of trying to play as many holes as you can, you know, in between events or if you're not traveling, just like keep getting reps, go challenge a guy to a match because there's no, nothing replicates playing competitive golf like playing competitive golf yeah. you can only hit so many balls in the range without a doubt yeah it's easy to get stuck out there in mm-hmm. the void <laughs> without a doubt yeah. but uh you boys got anything else uh, i know the answer to this but what's the best part of your game <laughs> uh short game <laughs> but um you know when i'm playing well i think i do a really good job of hitting my short irons accurately and converting butts you know so it's, it's just getting the ball in the hole inside of 150 yards is the yeah. best part for sure yeah, and you drive it pretty straight. I do drive it pretty straight, yep. Um, I mean, I generally say if everybody geared down and hit the ball at my distance, mm-hmm. they'd probably feel like they hit it pretty straight too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'll take the compliment. Yep. Yeah. And my question would be like, uh, like what, what tournament are you most like kind of excited for, whether it be like the PGA or something like that, like upcoming yeah, so um, that you have like Mark Turner County. The U.S. Opens at Pinehurst Number Two mm-hmm. this year, and I was in the last group on Saturday there in 2014. Mm-hmm. Just loved the way the golf course played that year. It played, it was really warm. It played really firm and fast. So distance didn't matter. It was all about hitting the ball accurately off the tee, and then running the ball into the greens and having a good short game. So you know that place can set up really well for my game, and um, you know it'd be really cool to make yeah. a run there in the state that I went to high school in. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Yeah, that's pretty much all we got. We appreciate yeah. you coming on. We have a couple submitted We got questions. submitted yeah. questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, I checked. Um, we got four quick ones here. Uh, this is for everyone. What are uh, some like brief go-to tips for a lad putting that you guys would have? That was what someone wanted to ask. Brief go-to tips. Just like something you work on when you're lag putting. I mean, if you were gonna throw, if you were gonna throw a football or shoot a basketball, like while you're thinking about, while you're doing, while you're committing that act. You're not thinking about really how far, you know, you're going to shoot the basketball or throw the football. It's all reaction based. Mm -hmm. So whenever I've struggled with lag putting is when I'm trying to be too perfect. So if you make it more of a reactionary thing and use more of your eyes and make it more like a second by second thing, I think Mm -hmm. that's a big thing. But he'd have a really good answer on that. Yeah, look and shoot. I love that. Um, You know, I think practicing on the speed of the greens you're trying to be good at so if you're at your home course and you want to lag putt well that day you better get to the practice screen and work on your long range putting on the speed of the greens you're going to play that day um one of the drills that you see a lot of people do is they'll put a tee or something maybe two or three feet beyond the hole 
you know, or maybe it's a club and you've got to go 20, 40, 60 feet and, you know, hit a certain number of putts inside between the, the cup and the, the club or the tee and just, you know, just little games like that can help. I mean, no, I mean, yeah, mine's kind of like obviously practicing on the green speed. Like, obviously, that's why there's practice rounds. Like, when tournaments, different courses, like, you got to get out there and kind of get a feel of it and stuff. Because I'm more of a feel, kind of like you. Yeah. But, but It's not something that just comes. Yeah. Like, it's not. It takes practice. Yeah, some people can <clears throat> take three weeks off, not touch a golf club, come back and stripe it. I've There's not many people that I've seen that can take three weeks off of golf and you put them 40 feet away from the hole and tell them to hit it within three or four feet every single time. I have not seen many people that can do that. So that's a, it's mm -hmm. one of those things you have to do every, either every time you're out at the golf course, you have, to make, you have to make a very concerted effort to do that. Otherwise it will come and go for yeah. sure. The next question we had submitted, uh, these are more little kind of uh, fun ones. Uh, who would be the worst caddy on the team? Who would be the worst caddy? Oh my gosh! I'm calling Buck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, he hits it so far. How can you? Yeah, no idea Buck. what how normal people. Hit yeah, that's ball. a good idea because like Buck, I feel like would be like, why'd you hit it here? Yeah, and he's just not like a, like happy, encouraging. Yeah, you know, like I mean, I have threw it into a par five, and he would be like, dude, I mean, we gotta have two hundred. Man, yeah, that's you gotta right. swing hard. You gotta swing yeah. harder. I think as far as familiarity goes, I think Buck would have a really hard time <laughs> caddying for anybody, just because, you know, he does hit it so far, and he stripes it. I mean, he doesn't miss many golf shots. he can't shots, manage so. his own game. Wait, who said that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. We're throwing shots. What about Brennan? Is there anyone on tour? Do you want to throw him? You go best or worst? Just, worst caddy on tour? No, like it, a player. A player that you would not want to have as your caddy. Or if you don't want to throw anyone under the bus, you could say, who would you like to have as a player but being on your back? Nah, you can throw a shot. <laughs> they won't see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to have Grayson Sig caddy because he's highly entertaining. Yeah. Um, but Michael Block. <laughs> I don't think uh, Keith Mitchell would make a very good caddy. <laughs> Saucer. Dude, uh, why, why you just hit the fairway every single time? <laughs> uh, next one, keeping on the caddy topic, what's your favorite caddy nickname? Because there's some good ones out there on tour. Oh, man, there's some really good ones. Is that like a good story? Um, Louis Oosthuizen and maybe Jeff Ogilvy have used a guy... Right, actually, right now he's cutting for Adam Scott. They call him helpful because he's so helpless. <laughs> he is so bad that they just nicknamed him helpful. So I like that one. Okay. There was a guy named Squirrel. There was a guy named Pepsi because he always hid a bunch of Pepsis and all the coolers. He'd walk around the course before. Keegan's caddy for a while. Yeah, right? Keegan's caddy. Um, man, there's some really good ones, but I always liked helpful. Yeah, I always love that there's like a good backstory yeah. behind all the that. <laughs> Helpful. And the last one we got, obviously Kisner has grown uh, is to be known as the funny guy on tour. Everyone loves playing with Kiz and he keeps a smile on everyone's face. And I feel like more of the world has gotten to see him in the booth yeah. more recently on this, uh, this season. Talk about being his teammate. Was he always that kind of class clown, if you will? Uh, yeah, I mean, I got to know him when I was 13 playing the Junior Azalea with him and Dustin Johnson. And, I mean, I could tell back then he kind of had a swagger to him, and I was, like, a little on guard about him. But, um, I mean, being on the team with, with him was awesome. You know, it was like he just was always talking trash and always challenging somebody to a contest and never backing down from anybody. So, he always kept it uh, entertaining and competitive. Um, and he says what's on his mind. You know, I think what people, as he's gotten older, he's, you know, become more mature and he's been able to channel that ability to speak what's on his mind um, in a good way. You know, because as Smiley even says about him, like, he's the guy that doesn't really filter what comes to his mind. Like, he pretty much says what comes to his mind. Um, which I think is a great quality for commentating, as long as it's, you know, whatever, acceptable, which he's done a really good job of. Um, so, you know, people that say what's on their mind, like, they keep it interesting. And uh, I think that's what, you know, makes him great on TV. But, you know, he's a great competitor and a good player. And I think, uh, you know, he'll get golf figured out and skip the booth here for the next 10 years.
Absolutely. Shout out Kisner. We love having him on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, you should get on the dog leg. Yeah, come on. <laughs> he'll be, he'll be great. That's all the questions we had submitted. All righty. Right. Well, we appreciate you coming on. Be yeah, Todd. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Being, our, you. First, being our first big guest. Go dogs. Go dogs. Like appreciate it. All right. Hope you all enjoyed that episode with uh, Brendan Todd. It was very cool. He finished fifth last week, so it was cool to get that perspective on him. But uh, keep giving us a follow on all of our social media platforms, and it's at the Dog Leg Show, D-A-W-G. And uh, please keep liking and subscribing, and uh, keep sending in questions, and we'll keep answering them. So thanks.